Howdy everybody. Good afternoon. It's Carpo here. It's a uh, afternoon. It's a Friday afternoon. First day of February actually. Hopefully I didn't forget anything. Birthdays or celebrations. Every time a month turns over, something uh, there's something to remember. But uh, so anyhow, in this in this particular video, I wanted to talk a little bit about monotheism and polytheism, uh, religion in general, as well as a couple of uh, you know thoughts about Buddhism and whatnot. First off. I'm not really opposed to religion itself. In fact, I was when I was younger, and the more I learn and the more I understand about people's needs, um, and the more I realize how little I know from the other people's perspective, then uh, I gained a little bit more understanding on the reasoning behind why we develop beliefs. In a world where we can't understand very much, uh, we tend to latch on to whatever we can find. And when we can find a, uh, a group that we can fit in with, and that's not always the case, of course. It's not always about fitting in. But uh, having the right answers is very important to people. And I guess the reason why I decided to make this was I was thinking, why monotheism over polytheism? And what was the historical reasoning for... Uh, kind of the switch into this one God mentality. And of course it's more complicated than that. You know, history doesn't just go in a linear fashion and one day they split the switch. All religions start as cults, if you want to get down to the details. You know, every group is formed by one person saying, I have the truth, and others saying, I'm going to follow your truth. Which isn't a problem in itself until it causes harm by forcing others to believe, but that's for another story. The question is, why monotheism? Was it for convenience or simplicity's sake? Maybe people didn't want to get to know all the different gods and understand the complex nature. It would be easy to attribute it to something simple like that. But it's much more complex, multifaceted, and there are a lot of reasons. But picture this. You're living in the desert somewhere in your town, your village, and you have your state religion where you live. Everybody believes that God will protect them. And then an invading army comes into your land and slaughters all your people. And over time, you start to wonder. You have an ambivalence towards your own beliefs. You say, why did our God lose the battle? You know. Then they start to question whether you chose the right belief system. Well, on top of that, you also attribute a personal guilt. Because if it wasn't your God that was wrong, then it was something that your people did to deserve what you got. And to me, this is one of the, one of the tragedies of religion, is the belief that we have brought upon our own misery. It is bad enough that we do bring upon a lot of misery in our lives. But to believe that it's our fault that an earthquake killed our family, or that it's our fault that uh, you know somebody, or some earth event happened, or a hailstorm, or you know our crops die one year and we figured we'd piss God off, you know, and that kind of mindset can cause uh, all types of uh, issues in the mind of the individual, to say the least. I guess uh, when it to come down to monotheism on, on a level of what do you picture? Is God just an idea? Or is it a man with a beard sitting on a chair? Um, but before I, uh, you know, move on from the idea of monotheism here, you should realize that Christianity itself is not monotheistic. And that's a major misunderstanding. You see, it's, there are plenty of passages in the Bible itself where they talk about gods and deities. The issue is that there's one superior God one ring to rule them all, if you will. And <clears throat> that means people can focus their energy towards one God. And many times it was the sun, you know, Ra. In ancient history, sun worship was pretty much self-explanatory. I mean, it's the thing that gives us all life. It warms the day. I mean, there's no way around it that that would be the original worship. But people wanted more. 
They wanted to anthropomorphize God. They wanted to put a face on God. And this is where Jesus comes into the picture. Although the story of Jesus is not unique in any way, shape, or form. There are over a dozen different stories with the same character, the same ideas, the same virgin birth, the same three stars, three kings, you know, whatever it might be, there are a lot, there's a lot to be said about the metaphors behind the beliefs. And that's what's always fascinated me, is that there is so much truth in there, but there's stories of our lives that, and they're mixed in with a lot of stories of things that have already happened historically. So in other words, I believe that a lot of the books of the Bible, for example, are actual accounts of events that happened or battles that happened. Yet some of them are taken from ancient stories about battles that may or may never have happened. It's kind of like Greek mythology. You know, many people know, uh, at least, you know, many believers in Greek mythology in, in ancient times, it's not that every one of them really believed that these gods existed in every single form that they're giving it. I think that the people, <laughs> give people more credit, they, they understood the metaphors behind it. But it is easy to ascribe a picture or an idea, a human characteristic to some of the issues that we feel. And the ancient Greeks were very wise to that. Um, kind of sometimes wonder, have we really become smarter? You know, because we th think we would grow up and, and grow out of things, but we're, uh, and, and I don't mean grow away from believing in something greater, but rather grow out of trying to define it because people have been trying to define it for thousands of years and so far everyone has fallen flat. You know, we see um, once Christianity forced itself on the world through the Crusades and millions were slaughtered in the name of my God's better than your God, um, it, we see this repeating and playing out today. It's a matter of desperation that sometimes drives people to do these things. And uh, like this morning, I was watching a show. It was a documentary about uh, a variety of different terrorist plots that had been foiled. And they were showing uh, videos of, you know, um, you know, the, the Hamas leadership, the videos that they put out, the propaganda videos that they put out towards the young men, you know. Join us and, you know, go to heaven, kill yourself, get 72 virgins, when there's nothing at all in the Quran about 72 virgins. A lot of people misinterpret, you know, what these extremists use as their validity for destroying others. That same language is found in the Bible and can, has been used in the past to destroy other cultures as well. But the aspect of the terrorist, you know, uh, situation, or rather terrorism in general, is that we live in a world where we have a lot more power than we once had as individuals. You could only swing a sword at so many people before someone would swing one at you. But when you walk into a crowded bus station full of, you know, innocent bystanders and you detonate a bomb and you don't care much about your life because you really believe you're doing something great for your people, that's something that's very difficult to address because, you know, when others don't fear death, how do you address that? How do you deal with it? We get to the bottom of human nature. We could say that well, many of these people are just fighting back against the U.S. because they've been oppressed. And uh, that's totally uh, understandable in many circumstances. But there's also the lonely, uh, <laughs> the homegrown terrorist, as they call them. The people who use religion as a, I'm going to join Islam because I'm pissed off at America. I'm just this, you know poor white boy who had a hard life, so I'm going to all of a sudden become radicalized because I saw these videos and I'm going to go attack my own people. It, do, do I take those people seriously as really believing in Islam? Of course not. But I use that as the example because this is exactly what governments have been doing to their people for a thousand years. When you go to battle, you're doing it for God and country. You're doing it for your God. You know, God is protecting your country. God even protects football games. The kind of bullshit that I hear coming out of people's mouths about what God wants and what God favors, you know? You just want to see them slapped, metaphorically, maybe even literally sometimes. The things I've seen, what I call toxic Christianity, there's a whole segment of the population that is just as toxic as the toxic Islam, um, and it's, uh, it's pretty disgusting to witness. You see these televangelists standing up there pretending they really care. 
and draining old people's pockets because they're sending them every penny that they can to hope that they can buy their way into heaven, you know? Just like the U.S. soldier might think, by fighting for your country, you're doing something great and that you'll be favored. Just like, you know, uh, somebody in Hamas, you know, some sort of Al-Qaeda terrorist cell where some kids pulled out of his village and told, hey, we know best. You want to be a hero? This will help your family in the long run. Um, it's easy to point the finger at people and just say people are ignorant, people are dumb, but that's never going to solve anything. We have to address the root causes. And to get to kind of a point here, it's like there are no innocent belief systems. Everything gets... It's circumstance that causes many of the conflicts, not the religion or the belief system itself. When people are feeling all right, they're not likely to go attack their neighbors. But uh, to give you an, an example of how bad it can get, um, there are Buddhists right now slaughtering Rohingya Muslims that have entered their country. Now, I don't. I have a really hard time knowing how to feel about that situation. These Muslims are fleeing into. Uh, in there from other countries, right? And so the locals, the Buddhist population, they are afraid that their land is being overrun by immigrants and people fleeing other problems. This is the same problem we have all around the world right now. Uh, but in order to protect their own culture, they're slaughtering villages full of people and burning their homes down. It's completely appalling. And then you see this guy in a red robe standing there saying, we have to slaughter them. You know, these people are dirty, they're diseased, they're all terrorists, they're all problem makers. The guy's wearing a Buddhist robe. You think, of course, it's, it's the metaphor. It's not about the religion or the belief system. It's about the individual and the circumstances that we face that cause us to lash out or to fight back. And, um, you know, while I'm on the subject of, say, Buddhism, you know, it's one of those things that, that's always been attractive, this idea of balance. And Zen, I would say that the idea of Zen Buddhism in itself is probably the closest to truth that I've found yet, because it doesn't try to answer questions. But I've always found it kind of funny that Buddhism speaks about karma and moving through lives and then eventually being able to learn your lessons so you can leave this world. They call it moksha. And I always wonder, why would you want to escape? They say the idea that your suffering is caused by your past lives and the karma you've accrued. But eventually you can escape this suffering. Yet if all the suffering was accrued through time, then there must have been a time where you had no bad karma and you created your own. In other words, the philosophical reasoning behind many belief systems to me, uh, when you really go deeper and deeper and deeper, then you start to say, well, wait a minute, even if this is true, it sounds a little hokey to me. I'll give me one last example, you know, going to heaven. And the idea to me is pretty appalling. You know, I've asked a lot of Christians, what do you think heaven's like? You know, I was speaking to these guys that came to the door last month, these Mormons, they're really nice kids. And I said, you know, well, wouldn't you... Don't you like being in your body and you have all your senses, you know? When you go to heaven, who knows what it's going to be like? And he says, oh, I'll be just like this. I'll be exactly as I am now. I was like, so you have to carry your material body with you? Or the, you know, why are we so attached to our bodies? But more than that, what are you going to do for eternity? He says, I'm going to enjoy heaven, be with my family and with my friends. I'm just like, well, what happens when you get bored? You know? What happens is when you realize that there are no challenges to face, and without those challenges, there's no balance. And without that balance, everything just becomes blah. Um, think it through, I guess, would be the key phrase. But really what it comes down to is believe what you're going to believe. Just don't be afraid of what you believe. And I feel like if our belief system causes us fear and anxiety about our lives, that maybe we're not living up to God's standards or whether or not we're going to get into heaven, I think we got a, a few more problems than just deciding between good and bad. In other words, good people know they're good people. You don't have to go around proving it to others. You just know in your heart when, you're, when, when you do good, and you know generally in your heart when you're doing wrong. And I believe this is pretty much universal. Sure, psychopaths, sociopaths, people who have lowered emotions out there. But let's just talk in general. 
You know, all of us really know right from wrong. Do you think the Ten Commandments was really brought down from a mountaintop? Of course not. These are just ideas people agreed on. But it sounds more authoritative if a guy in a robe gets them on carved on these giant stone tablets, you know, with lightning and thunder coming down from the mountains. Everything has to be built up to this great big look. This is the evidence for it, you know. And uh, one thing I found interesting is that, you know, if I were to tell you, well, I talked to God and he said that we need to change a chapter in the Bible, and you'd think I'm crazy. Any Christian would say you're absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. And then you would say, well, why is it that today, if anybody has a, a new spiritual insight for an existing religion, they're considered wrong, but we can believe bygone prophets that we never met face to face, we have no idea if they even existed. Every one of the people out there who believes the Bible today believes it based on the words that they were told and taught. And using the Bible to believe the Bible is circular reasoning and it doesn't work. So it works for a lot of people, they say. You know, I've had a lot of folks tell me, hey, the Bible's the only book you'll ever need. And all I can say is, is it really though? I mean, which area, which specific uh, part of the Bible? I mean, the part about slaves obeying their masters or stoning non-believers to death? I mean, I, I really, you know, and sorry to sound cynical or sarcastic, but um, uh, if you're gonna take it, you have to take it all, you know? You can't just cherry pick, but that's what we do as people. And I say, that's how it's going to always be. So let's cherry pick the good parts at least, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, people who are extremists will pick out the bad parts. And these are people who don't represent anything except for their own frustrations in life. And when it comes to, like I said, the preachers that uh, are up there telling you to send them money, I don't believe one of them believes the goddamn thing they're saying. <laughs> but uh, a lot of people do. And so it reminds me there's a lot of suckers out there, and it's unfortunate. And uh, I don't like seeing grandmas get their fortunes stolen by con men. So that aspect of it kind of puts a damper on the whole, uh, you know, believing a guy on a podium with a microphone, you know, that has no more authority than me. I mean, if you want to defend the Catholic Church, for example, and tell me why all the priests are rapists, and uh, molesters and pervs. I mean, the ratio was absolutely stunning, the amount of people that they found. And this isn't something that's probably within just Christianity, of course not, or Catholicism. This is within anybody who takes a vow of celibacy and decides to deprive themselves of their natural tendency to want to have sex and to have fun. And so they're going to end up making someone else suffer because of it. And what kind of a god allows this to happen? within the walls of his own church. Well, God doesn't have a church. God is everywhere. God is everything. God is within every one of us, and we will return to dust. And our souls may or may not traverse the universe. We don't know. But uh, in the meantime, I'd like to avoid uh, worrying about my 72 virgins um, or whether or not cussing is going to send me to hell. So, hope you all are doing well, and um, I'll talk to you soon. Take care.